Salmon there, uh, the leader of the Nationalist Party there. You just heard him concede the vote. Uh, that the no's have overtaken the yeses, although that his campaign was to move towards independence. And you heard him make several statements, one of which was how this is a different time and how looking forward in politics there in the UK are going to change and have changed because of this very referendum. Alistair uh, Jameson is there on site. He was just listening to Alex Sam, the leader of the Nationalist Party. And if you can, Alistair, tell us what happened there and what the mood is. Absolutely. Uh, we're here at the uh, main counting centre for the, uh, the Lights referendum, and we were listening to uh, that speech that was uh, shown on, on, on screens there. And, uh, and Alex Salmon actually there made a, a number of key points. First of all, that the huge turnout uh, in the referendum means that the vote is so definitive there can be no quibbling uh, about it. He had, to, he had to concede defeat, and he said that he conceded that there had been a no vote. Uh, and then he added, at least for now, uh, in the campaign for independence and very much describing it as a journey uh, towards an eventual goal. So clearly he thinks that the overall independence movement isn't going to go away anytime soon. And when you heard him speak there about this, this idea of rebuilding as one nation, don't forget that although he is the leader of the Scottish National Party, he's also the elected governor, he's the first minister of Scotland, uh, they have an elected government. So uh, they have a very uh, big task on their hands now to uh, reunite and rebuild. This is a vote which has caused deep divisions because it really has been a very passionate and intense campaign, and people have been uh, uh, often divided within families and between neighbours. And uh, now that the, the, the vote uh, and the result has happened, um, he now has to lead and show that uh, Scotland can move on and, and uh, take on these new powers, possibly from Westminster. And uh, he has to uh, walk a political tightrope over the next uh, few weeks and months ahead, I think. You know, Alistair, uh, now we've been close to, what, 6.30 in the morning local time, uh, up all night. And as we, we, you have been watching, uh, as well as those on the ground have been watching, the, the data coming in from the different constituencies, uh, the different counties, what do you believe precipitated Alex Salmon now coming out at this hour to concede? Well, um, the no campaign has actually uh, won. It, all they required was 50 percent, whichever side had 50 percent right. of the votes. Uh, first past the post, you are the winner. And uh, uh, I think we're not quite there with all the declarations. I think we're two to go. Uh, but I think uh, one of the major candidates, I think it was Fife, uh, declared uh, no, and that was enough to bring the tally over. So uh, it, is, it is officially uh, all over now. The fat lady has sunk. However, um, uh, it's, it's uh, in a context, the vote, the, the closeness of the vote is still remarkable. Right. Uh, I mean, only two generations ago, the idea of Scottish independence, uh, if you advocated that, you would have been regarded as, uh, as an eccentric, as, a, as an oddball. Uh, and the fact that this has become not only a mainstream movement, but has been elected into government into Scotland, and then to come within a, a hair's breadth of actually securing independence, that's right. remarkable. And particularly earlier, you heard the biggest city in Scotland and one of Britain's biggest cities voting yes for independence. That's a huge, significant historical marker for the whole of Britain. And that means that politics throughout Britain has got to change. And we'll hear from later on today from two people uh, this morning. First of all, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron is going to have to speak uh, and set out his plan to, to listen and to, and to uh, show that he has heard what voters have said. And also, we may hear from the Queen as well. Uh, we know that she's been listening and watching the campaign closely. She's in Scotland at the moment. Uh, so we may uh, get some uh, statement or guidance from the palace. You know, Alistair, stand by. Prime Minister Cameron, as you were noting, they're speaking shortly after 2 a.m. Eastern time. So we expect that to happen in the next 30 minutes, as early as within the next 30 minutes from 10 Downing Street. Of course, we'll be watching that. Uh, we got Richard Wolf here from MSNBC.com. Uh, you have been reflecting mm -hmm. on how politics, either way, in terms of the outcome of this independence vote, it has already changed, and we're about to see yet more changes. Right. You can say, well, Scotland is still part of the UK, so nothing has changed, but actually the politics of Britain has changed dramatically. You've got a rise of nationalism, English nationalism. We're going to hear mm -hmm. more from David Cameron today about more English powers for English MPs. Uh, obviously, Scottish nationalism has proved to be on the rise, but across Europe, you've got these anti-European movements, these separatist movements in various countries trying to establish themselves. Of course, part of that is coming out of that long recession. You always see those kinds of reactions, but it's also a disaffection with established parties. David Cameron himself is up for re-election in, uh, in May of next year, and this is a difficult time for him. He's got a weak coalition. He's obviously lost a ton of support in Scotland. 
The Labour Party could come back. It's his opposition left of centre party could come back and challenge him pretty hard now on the back of what they've seen in Scotland. So uh, very complicated politics. And of course, all this at a time when President Obama is looking to the UK to be a very solid partner with threats coming in from Russia and, of course, in the Middle East. Yeah, and expand on that, Richard, uh, as it becomes more complex in the UK and how it affects uh, US-UK uh, politics. Uh, you were mentioning that President Obama, depending right now, especially as we look towards ISIS and uh, that which is challenging D.C., challenging not only Congress, but also the White House, how this might affect some decisions that might go forward based on the complexity, uh, the election next year for the prime minister, and then how both Scotland uh, as well as England are communicating with each other. So, um uh, David Cameron has, is looking in the rearview mirror at the experience of someone like Tony Blair, who, very popular, uh, uh, re-elected several times, but really lost support because of his actions in Iraq and his support for President Bush. That's a cautionary tale for any British prime minister. So, yes, you can look at Syria and say the pictures are outrageous and, and ISIS is a brutal organization, but when you're a weak politician at home, when you've got this strong independence movements, you've got uh, English nationalist movement saying hey, your policy on Europe is wrong. Both sides is what you're saying. Both sides. Right. Then you've got a challenge when it comes to supporting another American president with another Middle Eastern war. Uh, very well said. Uh, back to you, Alistair, uh, there in Edinburgh as you're watching what's happening in Scotland. The turnout. Uh, we've got 16 and 17 year olds voting uh, in this referendum. You've been mentioning how we're in the 80s. An 80% turnout, you know, in the United States, uh, you would go, we must be in a different world. But in this case in Scotland, what has this done to the way they talk about politics and the way that the youth are now injected into this discussion, this debate that's happening there in the UK? Absolutely. And you heard Alex Salmon there uh, saying in his speech that uh, the turnout uh, uh, had been a triumph for, for the democratic process. Um, and... I think what it, the point he was trying to make there was that, uh, yes, this is a campaign which has really engaged people at, at all levels and all age groups. And the inclusion of 16 and 17 year olds was an unspoken gamble by uh, the independence uh, uh, movement. But younger voters tend to vote with their heart, not with their head. That was the implicit suggestion that if you allow younger voters to vote, you may tip the balance in favor of independence. In fact, poll after poll, of younger voters suggested that not only was that not the case, but in many cases they were more likely to do the research and to find out what the different sides stood for uh, than uh, voters two or three times their age. And uh, uh, we spoke to a group of 16-year-olds uh, who were voting for the first time this morning, uh, some of them in their high school uniform, I might add, and uh, most of them had uh, attended debates, had asked questions of uh, both sides, had attended rallies, and could quote uh, economic statistics. So it is not a given that uh, uh, younger voters are necessarily um, uh, you know, likely to, to vote in ignorance. And the argument throughout is that uh, if they are voting for independence, it's their generation um, that is at stake. So certainly it has changed the way that uh, politics is discussed and debated. And I think it could pave the way for calls for a permanent voting at the lowering age, if not in Scotland, then perhaps in the rest of the UK as well. Again, if you're just joining us, the last word is Lawrence O'Donnell. We are giving you the very latest coming out of Scotland. Uh, and the leader of the Nationalist Party there conceding uh, in the campaign that they had pushed forward over the recent months, which we've been talking about it here, to become an independent country. These are the numbers right now at this half hour, uh, 33 minutes after the hour. Yes, 1.5 million. No, 1.9 million votes. That's a 10 point difference, 10 percentage point difference, and again, the concession from the leader of this independence movement. And we'll bring, go back to Richard Wolf here, who's in New York, who's been watching the numbers. And as we've been going through it, was there any sort of thought, higher or lower turnout meant that it was going to go one way or the other? And we're kind of in the 80 to up to 91 percent turnout. Yeah, look, this is a very high turnout. We knew passions were high. And, uh, you know, British elections don't normally come out with this kind of high turnout. But we did see some disappointment for the Yes campaign, even in a city that they won, largest city in Scotland, in Glasgow. They needed to see a higher turnout there because it was actually less than that 80, 90 percent average. Mm -hmm. 
they needed to rack up the votes there to really uh, outbalance these other areas that were saying no to independence. That didn't quite happen. So they didn't have what you would call here a ground game. They didn't really have a consistent ground game that could push up their vote totals where they were winning on the yes question of independence. And that meant on this national election, a popular vote count across the country, they really fell short pretty significantly. All right, Alistair, we've got 45 seconds here. What's next? Uh, what's next is that uh, David Cameron has to set out uh, uh, his plans on how to uh, give more powers to Scotland within the existing framework so that Scotland uh, uh, can feel that it, it is not uh, as unfairly governed as clearly it does. And also Alex Salmond here in Scotland has to work out how he's going to heal the deep divisions uh, and, and some of the real rancor and bitterness that this campaign has caused. All right, Richard Wolf, Alistair Jameson, thank you so much, both of you.